Hi, I'm Lee Markham, and back in 2019, I was asked to prepare a presentation to be given at a luncheon at the First Presbyterian Church of Monroe to honor my dad, Reverend Paul Markham, through stories and memories. The date was set for March 15, 2020, during the church's bicentennial celebration. Shortly before the planned luncheon, America started to quarantine in response to the spread of COVID-19, and the luncheon was postponed to a future date. So during that time, I have created this video of my speech, which has the added bonus of photos taken by my dad and me and others. So here is what I had planned to bring to that luncheon. The First Presbyterian Church of Monroe has a wonderful history for two centuries, and I know that most of you have played some part in that history. For instance, Many of you took wedding vows there at some point. Well, so did Custer, and so did I. The general's marriage ended with his untimely death, and my first marriage just plain ended. Many of you were confirmed as members here at some point. Okay, me too, but I dropped out. So anyway, lots of memories here, and most of them good ones. So now we're off to a rousing start, and I'd like to thank you for inviting me to remember my dad as the church proudly celebrates its bicentennial of community service. Faye and I have become good friends with Diane Adams, and I'd like to especially thank her, as this was her idea in the first place. So if my speech bombs, you could blame Diane. Just kidding. My association with the First Presbyterian Church of Monroe parallels the time that my dad, Reverend Paul Markham, served the church as its pastor, and so I'll focus my remarks on that period of time. It will, out of necessity, be from my own point of view, and I hope you'll forgive me if I relate a few brief but relevant stories about my own experiences there as well. But this will mostly be about my dad. I believe that his tenure as pastor remains the longest in the church's history, and I'm very proud of his service. I'm amazed at how many people convey their fond memories of my parents, even to this day, even though they retired and left Monroe over 37 years ago. He began in 1959 as associate pastor under Wilfred Edgar Simpson, and in 1960, after Dr. Simpson's death, he was installed as senior pastor. In those days, the church had more than 800 members, and about 500 to 600 showed up every Sunday for 11 o'clock services. For most of my dad's time as pastor, he was the only pastor of that church. There were a couple of assistant pastors at different times, one of them for about six months and another for about five and a half years. Dad was there for a total of about 23 years. My dad served three congregations during his 40-year career. First Presbyterian Church in Fairgrove, Michigan, a tiny farming community in the Thumb, North Park Presbyterian Church in Grand Rapids, and First Presbyterian Church of Monroe. During his early career in the 1940s, dad worked as a counselor at Presbyterian summer camps in Michigan and there he became good friends with Dr. Simpson. Wilfred Simpson was the pastor of First Presbyterian Church for about 18 years and was deeply beloved by his congregation. He had previously served at the pa as the pastor of Fort Street Presbyterian Church in downtown Detroit, and he was 24 years older than my dad. He had a striking shock of pure white hair, and although he never had children of his own, he had a gentle, grandfatherly countenance. At summer camp, he got the nickname Chief, and it stuck. I think it's a safe bet that he recommended my dad to join him as associate pastor. Of course, the Presbyterian Church operates as a democracy, and pastors are selected and hired by the congregation. So, one Sunday morning, a committee from Monroe mysteriously appeared at the back pew of North Park Presbyterian Church in Grand Rapids. 
One of them I know was Dr. R. A. Freire, a physician from the Monroe Congregation. Now, Dad became a candidate, and soon a date was set for him to give an audition sermon in Monroe. Grand Rapids was still buried in snow in March 1959 after a very tough winter, and we drove to Monroe where we saw bare ground for the first time before, uh, since before Christmas. We stayed in the Park Hotel on Washington Street next to Loringer Square, by that time rather run down after a long, illustrious history of hosting the likes of President William Howard Taft, band leader Tex Beneke, and Buffalo Bill Cody. Dad gave his sermon, and a few weeks later, he told me we were moving to Monroe. In May, we moved to the upstairs apartment at 151 North Macomb Street, whose landlords then were Ann Lux's grandparents, Roy and Bessie Moyer. I know my dad felt thrilled and privileged to come to Monroe to work with his old friend and mentor, Chief Simpson. Now, just eight months later, in January of 1960, Dr. Simpson fell ill with cancer. He was hospitalized, and he passed away on January 25th at the age of just 66. Dad was named interim pastor on June 1st, and then on September 18th, he was installed as senior pastor. We moved into the manse on November 8th and woke up the next morning to learn that John F. Kennedy had been elected president. A new era had begun in the nation's capital, and a new era had begun for my dad and the First Presbyterian Church. It all happened very quickly. My dad later theorized that Dr. Simpson may have learned at some point that he was terminally ill and wanted to have a hand in selecting his successor. If that was the case, his wish came true. Now, I loved living downtown because everything we needed was so close at hand. The A&P store was where DeRocher's is now. There was a movie theater, schools nearby, the courthouse, the post office, the city hall, and a wondrous variety of shopping. I did lots of exploring downtown and went to lots of movies. Dad said that it was so quiet downtown that you could hear a pin drop. Indeed, you could because the back of New Center Bowling Lanes, today part of the church parking lot, was just behind us across the back alley, and you could hear lots of pins dropping there, especially in the summer when the windows were open. Dad's sleep was interrupted often by the courthouse clock during our first week, which faithfully chimed out the time every hour. But we got used to it quickly, Sunday services traditionally have started at 11, and if my dad was still preaching at noon, the clock alerted the congregation to the fact that it was time to go home. They'd get restless, so dad would have to wrap things up quickly. The Monroe County Jail was just across the street, and the old jail, built in 1925, was not exactly high security, and inmates escaped there fairly often. We also kept our doors locked downtown, but we didn't have to worry too much about jail escapees because once they were loose, they took off running and they sure didn't stop at our house. There were homeless people back then, as there are now, but in the relative insensitivity of that area, we called them bums. <laughs> My dad would direct them down 2nd Street where the Salvation Army fed and housed indigent people but sometimes he'd direct them to go around to our back porch where we had a small table and he'd give them a bowl of cereal or make them a sandwich. Sometimes he'd even walk them over to the bus station and buy them a ticket to their desired destination. The manse itself was a wonderful place to live. Just three of us rattling around in that huge house with a living room, dining room, a parlor, four bedrooms, a maid's quarters, a huge attic, and a big, spooky basement. Before my legs got too long, I could slide down the banister in the front stairway for a fast trip to the first floor, and my parents seemed to have no problem with this. We didn't have a maid, but I had a train layout in the maid's quarters above the kitchen, just as a previous preacher's kid, Fred Boehner, had once used the room for his ham radio setup. 
A few months before we moved into the manse, I had seen Alfred Hitchcock's classic movie Psycho in first run at the Monroe Theater. And to me, the manse was just like Norman Bates's house. I loved it. I never killed anybody, though. Another benefit of living in the manse was the huge yard I could play in between the house and the church. Vacation Bible school kids also use it every summer for their recreational breaks. My friends and I were fans of Alan Funt's Candid Camera on TV, and the big yard was ripe for playing stunts on the public as they walked along the Washington Street sidewalk. Ken Colbert and I took turns pretending to sleep right next to the sidewalk, and I even made a sign that said, Rip Van Winkle II trying to sleep for 20 years. Well, the other one of us would watch the reactions from inside the house. I figured out the phone number of the phone booth across the street at the Michigan Bell Building, and we'd sometimes call people and say funny things to them while watching them from the window. In the early 60s, the baby boom had stretched resources everywhere, and every nook and cranny of the church was used for Sunday school classes. In 1963, my beloved side yard went away, replaced by the Wilfred E. Simpson Memorial Christian Education Wing. It was fun to watch them building it. My friend Ken's dad, Ray Colbert, worked for Grattan Construction Company, and he ran the backhoe, digging the initial trench around the perimeter for the excavation. Later, bricklayers worked less than five feet from my upstairs bedroom window. One summer afternoon, I lay quietly on my bed with my window open and the curtains closed and eavesdropped on their conversations. I attended youth fellowship meetings, even from a time I was way too young to be there, because that's where my parents were every Sunday afternoon. In later years, I learned that the big multi-purpose room in the basement under the Boyd Chapel had been carpeted. It broke my heart because I knew there would never be roller skating there again. At some point, somebody must have perhaps donated a big pile of old decrepit clamp-on roller skates. If you sorted through them, you could find a few pair that still worked and how we loved skating. Back then, a ramp led up to the slightly higher portion of the basement that was under the sanctuary, and we could pull our way up the ramp and then roll down, often in a line, holding out of the waist of the person in front of us. It sounds kind of dangerous, but I don't think anybody ever got hurt. There was an old piano on which we'd bang out heart and soul. And on the stage, there was a ping pong table. And sometimes during a weekday evening, my dad and I would go over there and play ping pong. For a while, there was even a pop machine in the basement, which the youth group bought and to make a little bit of money from. A couple of times we had pizza parties, and of course then as now, it was the scene of many other events as well. I was a member of the choir mostly because my dad was in the pulpit, my mom was in the choir, and well, I was sort of expected to be in the choir too. Edith Harkrader was the first choir director, I remember, followed by Joy Schroeder, Mary Walker, and Walter Jones. Walter Jones was also the director of the Monroe High School First Choir, which I was also a member of, mostly to avoid taking gym. The wonderful Flora May Wolf was the organist when we came to Monroe, and later those duties were handled by people like Mary Walker, Arlene Douglas, Joy Schroeder, and Al Pifo. I'm pretty sure most or all of these organists had advanced degrees in music, and uh, Joy Schroeder's was from the University of Michigan. I'm sure that she wouldn't mind if I told this little story about her. As a true Maize and Blue fan, Joy revered the school's fight song, Hail to the Victors. One weekday while practicing her music for the coming Sunday, Joy decided to find out how that song might sound on the magnificent pipe organ bouncing off the walls of the big sanctuary. Well, I didn't hear it myself, but I did hear later that somebody, and I'm not sure who, wasn't too happy about it. And then there was John Greening, a very likable fellow I went to school with. John was a talented keyboard musician, and while he did sing in the Presbyterian choir for a while, 
His professional musical talents as an organist were directed toward the popular rather than the sacred. He often entertained at local night spots. Now, one time I heard that he managed to get into the choir loft and take a seat at the big organ where he proceeded to pound out some boogie-woogie music. <laughs> Again, not well taken by somebody, but I thought it was kind of funny myself. My dad inherited the church secretary who had been in that position for many years, Mrs. Vella Simpson, the wife and widow of dad's predecessor, Dr. Simpson. She was Canadian, and I will say that she was a tough old bird and pretty much ruled the roost. She had an office at the church, but when the Simpsons lived in the manse, one of the first floor rooms had a big desk in it a horsehair couch, and several chairs. And whenever they had company, she'd sit at the big desk and hold court. After Mrs. Simpson retired and later lived in a nursing home in Canada, I learned that she was rather restless there. That is, until somebody found the solution to her discontent. They put a desk in her room, and there she sat, happy as a clam. There were several custodians over the years, including Jay Venzel, Alvin Metz, Raleigh Wall, Linda Brooks, and today it's Gary Bogodin. Gary Bogodin has a uh, fancy title now, Sexton. I don't remember them being called Sextons. At least I didn't call them that. I probably would have been afraid of getting my mouth washed out with soap. I'm fortunate now to have my dad's pastoral record a huge black leather bound volume set up to record highlights of a clergyman's entire career and my dad faithfully filled out its pages starting with day one in Fairgrove in 1942 until his last day in Monroe in 1983. Every sermon he preached, every baptism, wedding, and funeral was noted there, even including how much the groom paid for each wedding and how much the family paid for each funeral. I found many years later that for one wedding, my dad had received zero compensation. Yes, there was a big goose egg written in the box for a 1977 wedding that took place in the Wayside Chapel. And who was the deadbeat groom? Well, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that it was me. Well, Look, after all, it was only my first marriage. What did I know? It just never occurred to me to pay my dad for something like that. I didn't pay the pianist either. She was my mom. I was certainly the beneficiary of a couple of very loving and patient parents. And I was a bit nerdy, but I wasn't really a bad kid, although I could tell you a few more things about what they endured with me, but I'll just leave it at that. Dad's pastoral record shows an especially large number of weddings in Monroe, 1,924 to be exact. If you don't count the time that he was on vacation, that averages more than seven weddings a month. He literally had more weddings than Sunday services. Yes, there were a lot of baby boomers getting married back then, but during the 60s and 70s, by far, the vast majority of the weddings showed the couple's addresses in Ohio, with whole pages of his pastoral record showing Ohio addresses exclusively, at times several times a week, and on a few occasions even two or even three per day. The age at which couples were allowed to marry was younger in Michigan than Ohio. Many young couples came across the state line to say their vows, their first stop was the courthouse, where they'd get a marriage license from the county clerk, who was uh, Beth Ann Winters. She'd even waive the waiting period for a slightly higher fee, and they could get married by the magistrate, but if anybody asked where a nice church was, well, she'd often send them across the street. The Wayside Chapel served that purpose as well. My dad would begin by sitting down with the couple, offering them some counseling, and one of his suggestions was try never to go to sleep angry. Then he'd send them downtown and ask them to purchase a 12-inch candle 
which he would place on the altar during the ceremony. After the wedding, he'd blow it out and present it to them, suggesting that they light it up every year at the table for their anniversary dinner. Then abruptly, in the spring of 1974, the Ohio weddings stopped. The laws must have changed at that point. In 1967, he co-officiated Monroe's first ecumenical wedding at St. John's Catholic Church between Gilbert Dunning and Dr. Jean Golden. My dad preached 1,239 sermons in Monroe. Dad had a strong, clear voice that projected well, and he could do quite well without the public address system. They usually used it anyway, but the acoustics were excellent, and Dad's strong voice really didn't need much amplification. There was a group called the Couples Club, consisting of young couples, most of whom had children, and they had many activities and social occasions, often spending New Year's Eve together at somebody's house, and every summer, Frank and Wilma Taylor hosted them and perhaps other church members for a picnic at their cottage on Middle Lake in Irish Hills. The church had an annual progressive dinner in December in which the various courses were served at different homes. The crowd always ended up at the manse for dessert. My mom would decorate the place lavishly for Christmas. The fireplace was roaring and one time I counted about 90 people in the house at once some of them sitting on the staircase like bleachers. The evening always culminated in the singing of Christmas songs with Arlene Douglas or maybe Mary Walker at the piano, and ultimately a stirring round of the 12 days of Christmas was the lively finale. Back in the day when pastors were almost exclusively men, the pastor's wife was expected to play a major role in the life of the church. And my mom sure did. Rowena Markham had been an elementary school teacher right up until she got married, but when she became the pastor's wife, she was in there pitching every day. She attended all church functions, assisted at weddings, attended meetings of all the ladies' guilds, sang in the choir, taught Sunday school and Bible school, helped out with the youth fellowship meetings, and did many more things that I can't even think of all while raising me, and she acted as the chief advisor to my dad. I liked living next door to the church because I could escape and go right home right after church ended, long before my parents came home, welcomed by the aroma of a roast beef that had been cooking in the oven for two and a half hours. But when they did come home, mom was usually having quite an intense discussion about everything that had taken place that morning and telling my dad all about what she had observed and what she thought about it. And he always listened to her thoughts and suggestions and gave them solid consideration. They were truly a pastoral team in the old tradition. The church had a Boy Scout troop and a Cub Scout pack, and when we came to Monroe, I already was in the Cub Scouts, long, but long hikes and camping out in the cold didn't appeal too much to me, so I dropped out after completing the Weebelows level in Cubs, but the Boy Scouts thrived at First Presbyterian Church even without me. Under the leadership of people like Arthur Lesso, Thale Piltz, and Don Miller, among others. One of my good friends stuck with it many years later when I reconnected with him on the internet. He wrote to me, Lee, you should have stuck with the Boy Scouts. You could have been smoking by the time you were 12. I'd like to take a moment here to pay tribute to one of the most beloved members of the First Presbyterian Church, perhaps of all time. Even before we moved to Monroe, my family and I had heard of her. When we lived in Grand Rapids, my grandparents from Chicago visited us for my birthday Grandma gave me a copy of a book she had purchased in Chicago for me called Little Brown Monkey by Elizabeth Upham McWeb. Now, you thought, I bet you thought I was going to say Little Brown Bear, didn't you? But no, this was a book by the lady we would later come to know as Aunt Bet, and it was called Little Brown Monkey 
a somewhat lesser known title than her little brown bear, and I still have it. During the first couple of years I lived in Monroe, I was among a group of kids who would visit Mrs. McWebb, as we called her then, out on a farm on North Monroe Street, across from what later would become the Mall of Monroe. Every other Saturday morning we'd go out there. She always had something interesting for us to do. We'd check out the little brown bear house in her backyard. We'd make ice cream in a hand crank ice cream maker, pull taffy, make ceramic items in her kiln, pump water from the hand pump near her back door, or just listen to her play music on her out-of-tune piano, deliberately kept that way so the kids could bang on it to their heart's content. She'd entertain us singing songs and imitating Jimmy Durante at the piano. We'd sometimes take a walk back through the field, and across the creek we could see the back greens of the Monroe Golf and Country Club. Once she even bought a burrow named Juddy to delight the children. But he was a biter, so we couldn't get close to him. He didn't last too long. Aunt Bet was a lady who had such a big heart that she would carefully catch flies in her house to release them outdoors and feed the mice she found in her basement. Sometimes she'd read stories to us on, in, in Sunday school or at the library, and she was truly one of a kind. I'm so glad to have known her and had the opportunity to introduce my children to her. I was once asked to speak at a dinner at the Holiday Inn honoring her. She was elderly and they thought she was going to be gone soon, but she lived for many more years after that. I could go on at great length with great stories about Aunt Bet. She continued welcoming children to her home throughout her later years and she died in 2004, just short of reaching the century mark. Her only child died as an infant, but she had hundreds, maybe thousands of kids who loved her dearly. Alma College was the Presbyterian school in Michigan, and although it offered free tuition for pastor's kids, I chose a more secular educational path at Monroe County Community College, Eastern, and University of Michigan. But every year, the church recognized Alma College and some of its students and grads at Alma College Sunday, once even hosting the school's president, Dr. Swanson, as guest speaker. Um, C.S. McIntyre of the church served on the board of Alma College for some time. Now, the late Frank Taylor and his lovely wife, Wilma, were the parents of three beautiful blonde daughters who went to Alma. Mr. Taylor was the director of Monroe High School Band for many years. He wrote a hymn about the church, and I believe it was on the occasion of the 150th anniversary. Mr. Taylor was very appreciative of my father's ministry, and I believe it was he who made the suggestion that my dad be considered for an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree from Alma College. It was approved in, on June 10, 1972. We, along with the Taylors and nearly a dozen other members of the congregation, traveled to Alma for the school's commencement ceremonies, and there my dad was one of two to receive their honorary Doctor of Divinity that day. The other was Dr. Theodore Hesburgh, the famous president of Notre Dame University, who during his career received over 150 honorary degrees, but I know my dad was well-deserving and very proud of his special honor. In 1979, an anonymous donor gave my parents an 11-day trip to the Holy Land. They very much enjoyed the trip and all they saw there. It was the only time they ever traveled outside of the North American continent. Dad was active in lots of community activities and organizations, and one of them was the local chapter of the American Red Cross. Before he retired, somebody had a lovely brass plaque made to commemorate his service to the Red Cross, but he got away to California before they could give it to him. Nearly 25 years later, somebody found it tucked into a drawer after the director of the local chapter, Beth Ann Winters, had died, and shortly after that, it finally made its way toward me. My parents were still living, and so, on my next trip to Pasadena, 
I took it with me and presented it to my dad just a quarter of a century late. He proudly displayed it on the wall at their retirement home. When I was growing up, we always listened to WJR, and my dad enjoyed Bud Guest's Sunny Side of the Street program. Bud was the son of the famous poet Edgar A. Guest, and Bud's program consisted mostly of him reading letters from listeners, some of whom created for themselves interesting ongoing character identities for the show. My dad wrote many letters to Bud filled with interesting stories, always signing them as the poor parson of Monroe. This was based on a character in Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales called the poor parson. My dad told me one time that he had written a total of 99 letters to Bud Guest over the years, and thus he became quite well known throughout WJR's multi-state listening area. On a couple of occasions, he was invited to appear with Bud live on the air from the station studios in Detroit. People still mention it to me after all these years. My dad took his ministry seriously, but on the side, he seemed to have a little comedy act going most of the time. Of course, the, the letters to Bud Guest contain many elements of humor. One time, he was asked to give a stand-up comedy performance for a fundraiser at the high school. He was a member of the downtown Kiwanis Club, which was a bunch of guys having lunch every Wednesday and mercilessly roasting each other after lunch. One time he showed up there with Morris Tubbs, pushing him in a wheelchair, even though he was able-bodied, and I don't remember what that was all about. He was known as the Poet Laureate of the club. I know that most of his poems and other remarks were filled with rollicking humor. Just this past November, I received the Monroe Kiwanis annual flyer that came with the Monroe News. An old photo at the top of the cover included my dad, with some of his fellow Kiwanians this 36 years after he left Monroe. He sent funny homemade greeting cards to people and labeled them Palmark cards. Not Hallmark, but Palmark. From time to time, he'd make up a series of about a dozen postcards for a friend, each card containing just a phrase or a few words of a longer rhyming message poking good-humored fun at the person, and he'd mail them weekly, one by one, with the last card carrying the final punchline. Dad loved playing chess and cribbage, and sometimes he took a break from his busy schedule going over to the Masonic Temple to play with some of his fellow Masons. But another thing he did was to play chess with friends who lived far away through the mail. Each postcard indicated one chess move, and these games could take months to complete. My dad learned trombone as a young man and played in his high school and college bands. Some of my earliest memories are of my mom at our living room piano and dad standing behind her with the trombone playing hymns. Sometimes he'd treat the congregation to a performance. He also was a great fan of the popular big band trombonists, Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey. Now, Dad's middle name was Burleigh. That's spelled B-U-R-L-E-I-G-H. Paul Burleigh Markham. And I'll bet you never heard that before. It was an old family name he detested. I know he even told people that he didn't even have a middle name. And I think that's the only lie I ever knew of him telling. I knew he had a middle name that started with B, but he'd never tell me what it was. I only found it out through seeing it somewhere by accident, but later in life, he seemed to accept it. Mom's big secret was her age, but I finally figured that one out too. Early in 1981, at age 63, Dad began to experience chest pains, and although he never had a heart attack, he had serious blockage due to angina. He had surgery with five bypasses, but he recovered well and returned to work a couple of months later. When Dad retired in 1983, Bud Guest was scheduled to be the main speaker at the retirement dinner, but a winter storm struck southeast Michigan that night. The roads were in terrible condition, and Bud, quite elderly at the time, 
wisely decided not to risk driving down to Monroe. It was an honor, however, to have Mayor Sam Mignano present and several others offered warm tributes. In 1958, after my grandfather retired from the ministry, we visited my grandparents at their retirement home for Presbyterian ministers in Pasadena, California. We still lived in Grand Rapids at the time, but my dad was so impressed with Monte Vista Grove Homes that he decided then and there that it would be his and my mom's retirement venue. He inquired at the office as to how he could get on the waiting list, and they told him he'd have to wait a while because he was only 40 at the time. He then focused upon his 65th birthday as the time to retire, and years later, he applied as soon as he could. He turned 65 on January 22, 1983, and the next morning he preached his farewell sermon. It was aptly entitled, Total Commitment. A few days later, a moving van backed up to the manse and mom and dad headed west after more than 23 years in Monroe. This new and final chapter in their lives together lasted for 30 years in beautiful Pasadena, and they remained very happy and active most of that time. My mom died in 2013, and then my dad survived her for a couple of more years. The last time Faye and I saw my dad was when we visited him in Pasadena in the summer of 2015. He had to be fed, and the staff didn't want us in his room while he was being fed, and he slept all night and most of the day when he wasn't being fed, so it was very difficult to visit with him. I still wrote a weekly letter to him, as I had done throughout my parents' retirement, which someone would read to him, and I called every week as well, but it was also very difficult to visit with him on the phone because he was barely responsive. After his bypass surgery and at the age of 63, he had told me optimistically that he might have another 10 or 20 years to live. He actually lived 34 more years to the age of 97. He died peacefully at the, on the morning of October 20th, 2015. Behind him, he left a wonderful legacy and many good memories among those who remember him. Throughout my childhood, I was asked countless times by so many people if I was going to follow in my father's footsteps. Yes, it was a little annoying because I knew pretty early on that I would not, and as you know, I followed a different path from my dad's. My parents never, even once, suggested what they thought I should do with my life. They left it up to me. My parents loved me unconditionally, and in so many ways, they continue to be my guiding light and loving inspiration now that they're gone. The love they demonstrated not only to me, but to everyone they met, was returned to them generously. I'm proud to be the son of Reverend Dr. Paul Markham, who pastored the First Presbyterian Church of Monroe for longer than anyone else, and who left an indelible mark upon the church and the community. Thank you, and if you have any questions or comments or memories to share, I would encourage you to contact me at Lee Markham and the number four, spell just my, like my name with the number four after it, Lee Markham four at gmail.com, which is also listed below on this YouTube page. Thanks again. <music>